Welcome to Bottom Up, a monthly podcast dedicated to issues and topics of interest to young lawyers in Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Emil Oviagele. And I'm Kristen Hardy. And we're your hosts. This is the Bottom Up Podcast. It's always the hardest part is, is starting. Start. <laughs> starting. That's the hardest part. Do you guys have compilations of our bloopers? And oh, please these? don't. Delete them. Could no. you like make, make us? Uh... No, burn them. <laughs> Well, hey guys, in today's episode, we're exploring the power of a multifaceted legal journey in a segment I like to call hanging out with a legal legend, embracing practice diversity in a hyper-specialized world. And today we have a legend in our midst, a titan in the profession, attorney Frank Gimbel, a founder of Gimbel, Riley, Garen, and Brown, GRGB Law. And you just done so much, but I'm not going to even downplay because any description of uh, attorney Gimbel's career would, by me, would not do it justice at all. Everyone who's listening to this episode probably knows who you are, Frank. <laughs> well, good or bad. <laughs> Let's just well, say welcome. that, uh, you know, uh, we used to have the department stores. No, no relationship. <laughs> but uh, it did give the name an opportunity to be up on buildings, etc. But there was no real great historical legends that uh, I followed as I have pursued my uh, journey down the roadway of a practicing lawyer. Well, since you wouldn't do it, I'll, we'll just do a little summary of all the things you've, you've done and all the things, uh, all the different practices you've had. So, you know, you were an assistant U.S. attorney from, you know, in the 60s. Uh, and you prosecuted some high-profile cases. Uh, afterwards, you became the founder. You started your own law firm, which has now grown into Gable Riley, Garen and Brown, one of the more uh, distinguished boutique full, uh, full practice firms in the, in the city of Milwaukee. You've practiced, you, you did criminal defense, you've done complexive litigation work, you've done employment work, you've done litigation, you've done licensing, you're a power broker, you've been the president of the Milwaukee Bar Association, the State Bar Association, helped build the first Wisconsin Convention Center. You've done a lot. Well, uh, <laughs> let's just say that uh, I had my fingerprints on all of the things that you've mentioned, Emil. I have been elected to office in the legal profession. I have been appointed by political authorities uh, from both parties to exercise an opportunity for civic leadership. And uh, those have been great adventures. They were not adventures that were delivered. The objects were delivered single-handedly by FMG. But uh, most assuredly, uh, I think, as uh, we move down the road of our experience, particularly as trial lawyers, we uh, have to know what makes different people tick if you're going to try a case in front of a jury, uh, you're looking at those 12 people that are going to make the decision in your case. You're looking for who's going to be you during the deliberations in the back room when you're not there. You're attempting to sell that person or that small group of people to deliver your message. And I think that's true in all of the endeavors that one engages in, whether it's uh, under the umbrella of your law office name, or whether it's under the umbrella of a district like the Wisconsin Center District created by the Wisconsin legislature to build a convention center in Milwaukee, whether it's uh, something created by the Wisconsin legislature like the Milwaukee Fire and Police Commission with a mission to uh, kind of regulate, if you will, the operation of a major metropolitan police department and fire department or whether it is uh, something that um, has uh, maybe iliomastinary objectives to deliver to groups within our society that need shoulders to lean on or to be uplifted. And I give credit for uh, my successes if, in fact, uh, at the end of my days, uh, I will be viewed as having been successful to the upbringing that I had from two parents, neither of whom went to college in a household where education was pushed. I had a brother who passed away, who graduated from law school as well as I, who went to work for the government as an attorney in the Justice Department in Washington, D.C. with some interesting adventures. <laughs> Died way too young at age 58 uh, during surgery for a heart aneurysm. I have 
three sons that are lawyers. And I have one daughter who's married to a lawyer. So can I give a little shout out to Josh? I think you, you'd be you can give a shout out to art. anybody and everybody. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, it, it, as as what I intended to be a short little response to this glorious introduction that you give me, Emil. The fact of the matter is that I have uh, kind of uh, gone with the wind, if you will, down the road of uh, trying to make a difference in whatever uh, badge I'm wearing on my chest, whatever hat I'm wearing on my head, or whatever the colors of my uniform in those areas that I'm pursuing for the moment. And uh, there has been a substantial overlap in those things. So you talked a little bit, and and Frank, this is my first time having the opportunity to meet you um, and just doing some of our research. You, Emil touched on it beautifully. You've really done some of everything, your fingerprint has been on everything. So you started talking about um, your upbringing. So curious to know what motivated you to pursue a career in law? Um, And then what are some of the challenges that you faced along the way? Well, when I was born in 1936, my father owned a tavern near the courthouse, believe it or not. And a lot of cops used to visit there. He busted out there. Uh, He then owned a liquor store in the corner of Sixth and Wisconsin. He busted out there. Busted out means he spent more money in operating the business than he took in. And so he became insolvent. He became then a commissioned salesperson. And my mother and he lived a modest life. When I was uh, starting grade school on the west side of Milwaukee, we lived on 40th an hour in a lower flat. The rent was $40 a month. I went to Townsend Street School. If you uh, look at the calendar and what was going on in 1936, you will find that there was uh, an emergence of fascism in Europe. One of the objectives, if you will, of the uh, enemies, Germany and Italy in particular, was to persecute and to bring about the elimination of Jews, kind of uh, being repeated today. I was a Jew. I went to a school that was uh, primarily in a neighborhood where there were working people, factory workers and what have you, many of whom had uh, German ancestry. Uh, There were many, many days uh, during the years between 1936, when I was born, and uh, the the first 10 years of my life when I walked to Townsend Street School, where I was called a dirty Jew. Uh, That brought about in in me uh, a choice between either standing up and uh, seeing how I could get out of this thing, equalizing the feelings I had uh, of animosity flowing from the other guy, or to run. And uh, half the time I ran, half the time I duked it out. And so there were many uh, times between 1936 and uh, 1946, when my family moved to Whitefish Bay, where I I literally uh, had to fight for who I was and what I believed in on the street, Uh, not figuratively, but, uh, but actually. And I think that it implanted in me a sense that you should always stand up for your beliefs. And if standing up for your beliefs is a debate, so be it. If standing up for your beliefs is to um, be on the podium and articulate your beliefs, so be it. If standing up for your beliefs is to uh, exchange punches and uh, try to uh, succeed in those kinds of uh, contests, so be it. And I was in those kinds of contests. I, 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 was athletic uh, in a sense. And I uh, learned that principles are important and that if you have them, don't surrender them because there is some fear of harm being visited on you in response to those principles. So it sounds like throughout these formative years, you go through these moments of adversity and you explain the larger <clears throat> the larger context in which this was taking place, and from that was the birth of this this I, I call it the man behind the man, which is the idea of you always stand up for what you believe in, and you never wanted to be put in a situation where you could be silenced, which I guess would make law career in law it seem was. like a logical. And, and my, and my next dad step. had my dad had two brothers, Uncle Jack was. Uh, younger than my dad. Uh, He was a lawyer. Uncle Seymour was my dad's brother. He was 18 years his junior. He was a lawyer. And I did see them 
uh, growing up, and I did get a flavor, if you will, of what they were doing. And then my Uncle Jack married uh, a lady whose dad, his name was Charles Swidler, was a, a spectacular trial lawyer in the 1940s and 1950s. He tragically died uh, when he was 58 years old. But before he died, he uh, would go into the courtroom, and I watched him try jury trials when I was in high school. And whether it was a criminal case or a civil case, he had uh, a combination of eloquence and shtick. And uh, it implanted in me the notion that successful litigators have to be prepared, but they have to have a little bit of a larceny in their soul because you're trying to sell somebody your client's predicament and seeking to bring about a good result for your client to leave that predicament. And uh, what you have to do is, is you have to impress upon the decision maker, whether it's a judge, 12 people sitting in the jury box, or nine people sitting on the bench of the Supreme Court, where I have also uh, appeared as a lawyer. And um, I think that I oriented myself to to those kinds of, if you will, qualities very early on. And uh, they have stood me well. I took speech, uh, extemporary speech, uh, as an extracurricular activity at Whitefish Bay High School. One of my classmates, a guy named Bob Habish, turned out to be a very successful, <laughs> extraordinary personal injury lawyer, made a lot of money. We did competitive speaking. Really strangely and ironically, we both starred as uh, players in the uh, play called The Night of January 16th in front of a jury from the audience. And he was the criminal events lawyer, and I was the prosecuting attorney. And we had three uh, different uh, performances. He won two and I won one. And he always uh, said uh, thereafter that he says, I let you win that one, <laughs> which wasn't true. <laughs> and what I learned, that there is a quality uh, of empathy in the universe we live in. And if you are representing somebody who has a good cause. It's kind of the American response, if you will. And I say that globally because it's not necessarily true and we're seeing that today. But it's kind of globally true that Americans have a kind of an underdog saturation. That, that they, they look to, to the underdog, look to help the underdog. And so as I, ha I, as I observe that, you know, I, I, I try to kind of use that to be a champion, if you will of people who couldn't champion for themselves. And now, word from our sponsors. State Bar of Wisconsin members have access to affordable insurance plans, including term life, accident, critical illness, and accidental death and dismemberment. Coverage is issued by the Prudential Insurance Company of America. For more information, visit wispar.memberenroll.com. What? You don't have an ultimate pass yet? Oh, that's a mistake. Find out why at wispar.org slash ultimate pass. Thank you. And now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. I got involved very, very, very significantly after I graduated from law school because I was making 150 bucks a month with a general practicing lawyer. It was my first job. I had uh, a wife and two children to support. I was struggling. And Today's I worked, dollars, how, how much did it been? Today's dollars would probably be $1,000 a month. And I had two children. And at that time, I uh, got involved in local democratic politics in 1962. I ran for the state assembly. And I was residing in Fox Point, which was never voted for a Democrat in the history of its existence. And that included Whitefish Bay and Charwood and Brown Deer and Glendale. And I ran against a guy named Niall Swike, who was a right-wing West Point grad who worked for Alan, Alan Bradley, so he was a right-wing Republican at the time. I lost. But uh, in the process of that, in the process of uh, uh, getting connected with uh, people like John Reynolds, who won that year's election to become governor, Gaylord Nelson, who became U.S. Senator that year, Henry Royce, who was a U.S. representative uh, that year and years around it because he had a much larger, larger geographic plot. I got noticed by a fellow named Pat Lucy. Pat Lucy was the chairman of the Democratic Party. And uh, in 1963, 
Pat Lucy invited me to have lunch with him at the Schrader Hotel. That's now the Hilton. And I was sitting at a table with him, and he said, uh, Frank, I want to tell you that I have noticed a lot of good stuff about what you've done for the party. And my uh, peers and I, he might have not have used the word peers. Pat became governor, by the way, of the state of Wisconsin and eventually council to Mexico. I uh, would like you to be the chairman of the Jefferson Jackson Day dinner at the arena in 1963. That was about three months from the date of this luncheon. And I said, Pat, I'm honored. I would love to do it. However, I have a wife and two children. I'm not making a living. I know that there's an op opening in the U.S. Attorney's Office right now. If you could help me get a job in the U.S. Attorney's Office, I will do anything for you except commit a crime. He called the Mater D over to the table and he said, could you bring me a phone? This is 1963. They didn't have cell phones. And he got on the phone. The phone was answered on the other side. He said, hey, Bobby, how are you? How's Jack? Listen, I've got this brilliant young lawyer who's done a lot of good stuff for us. And he would like to be in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Milwaukee. I would really appreciate if there was something you could do to make that come true. Really? Oh, that's fabulous. Thanks. Hangs up the phone. He says, okay, Frank. He says, you've got the job. I says, were you just talking to Bobby Kennedy? He said, yes. And Jack was talking about Jack Kennedy? And he said, yes. Well, it turns out Pat Lucy was the chairman of the John F. Kennedy presidential primary campaign in the state of Wisconsin in 1960. And in that campaign, he beat Hubert Humphrey. It was an overwhelming victory. And it mobilized the campaign, so he became the nominee. So here I am, this kind of piss-in-your-pants young lawyer, okay, <laughs> with the chairman of the state Democratic Party asking me for a favor, and he's giving me in return this opportunity. He says, tomorrow morning you call Jim Brennan, he's the U.S. attorney, because Bobby Kennedy's going to call him right now and say, give you the job. And that happened, and I got the job. And in the fall of 1963, Three, I was sworn in as an assistant U.S. attorney, and for a period of five years, I learned how to try a case, and I learned how to try a case with the extraordinary resources of the United States government, which far exceeds even the, the resources of Foley and Lardner, Quarles and Brady, Northwestern Mutual, or uh, the other uh, large entities that uh, generate uh, money in the private market. Well, it's a little different when the... FBI is doing your investigations, and you get to say, I have the pleasure of representing the people of the United States. Every U.S. attorney loves that line. <laughs> and, I can't, I can't, and I can't lie. Every time you hear it, it's very powerful <laughs> when, when, you, when, when it's said to you. But, but Christine, I'm gonna <laughs> I was going to say, so 1963, you're three years out of law school. Right. So a very young lawyer, um, do you look back on that moment of asking for that favor as, huh, that took a lot of courage? Uh, or is it more of a, you didn't think anything of it? They were asking you for something and you asked for something. Uh, I did not think it took courage. I did not invite the lunch. Sure. Uh, Patrick Lucy wanted something from me. That's right. Uh, as Emil has said, uh, I have for reasons that I can't explain it because it would be immodest been the target or the subject matter of a lot of articles, profiles, and what have you. And uh, within one of those profiles, which occurred many, 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 many years into my having left the U.S. Attorney's Office and been in the private practice and have been involved in community activities, Patrick Lucy was interviewed, and he was in his 80s, and uh, he said some very kind things about me. So uh, he had a genuine feeling about the fact that that I uh, was a person who was good for the brand, if you will, mm. of the Democratic Party in the 1960s, which uh, was a different brand than it has today. I'm not sure how different, but it, it's, 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 um, it's played out differently than it does today. So for, for, for other lawyers listening, based on the story you just told, what's, what's the lesson to be gleaned? How the lawyers get to put themselves in that situation? Because you, um, you did it quite early. I mean, this is... I, I did it very early, and I was of the view, maybe motivated, uh, and this is the first time I'm saying this, maybe mo motivated by the fact that my dad was a commission salesman, okay? And if you're a commission salesman, you only get paid if you make a sale. Yeah. 
Uh, and uh, if you take that notion and apply it to a young lawyer, uh, and the young lawyer uh, says, well, how do I become experienced, well-known? Get involved. And get involved, if you will, in a way that uh, includes an ingredient of mobility. Uh, you can be the president of your church or your synagogue. You can be the president of your Elks Club uh, or what have you. And that has value, but it doesn't have the same value that Frank Gimbel got, who moved from the north side to the south side, from the east side to the west side of Milwaukee, selling liberal politics in a time when there was not the level of prosperity and standard of living that exists today. And I went through World War II, and I went through the early stages of, uh, of the time when uh, there were, or the late stages of the Depression, but early times when there were a lot of kind of restrictions on activities that people were, were imposed on because of World War II. And uh, there's nothing similar to that now. I mean, we can be involved in two or three wars, and there's no restrictions at home in terms of economics. So uh, I, I guess when, when you look back and try to explain how come this happened and why did this happen and why were you able to do this as compared to somebody who's starting out today, uh, e every person has to respond, and I use that word advisedly. I think response is uh, a word that people should try to put in their everyday thought process because when you respond to a situation that uh, requires assistance to your parents, assistance to your spouses, assistance to your children, assistance to your community, assistance to groups within your community, whether it's uh, a political party or it is a cause for a particular illness to be addressed, do it and invest yourself in it. And uh, not only will the indications or incidents that brought you to that cause, motivated you to that cause, but there'll be a, there'll be a, a reward, not an intentional reward, not a reward that you sought to obtain, but there'll be a reward from the experience. And I've been the beneficiary of the reward from many of my experiences because I had the opportunity, some of which I created on my own by not sitting at home reading the newspaper. But, but once I got the opportunity to, to lead in the construction of the Wisconsin Center District, once I got the opportunity to be the, the president of the State Bar of Wisconsin, I got the name the Wisconsin Bar Bulletin, the Wisconsin Lawyer, and that's the name of it. That happened on my watch. The same thing in the Milwaukee Bar. So things that, that were creative that go back to communication skills, response to something that appears to be required or needed or helpful to whoever you're addressing. Respond to them in a way that will both serve their needs and interests, and the benefit will flow back to you in terms of rewards that may not have been your objective to start with. And I'd like to say when I'm sitting talking to two distinguished young lawyers about my adventures in 63 years in the practice of law, I'd like to be able to say that I had a game plan and it all worked out. I didn't. It was a, it was a game plan that was modified from hour to hour, day to day, week to week, year to year. And it worked out. And now a word from our sponsors. Who better to trust when you're facing a malpractice claim in Wilmick? With your Wisconsin licensed claims attorneys and strong network of defense counsel, find peace of mind with Wilmick. Supporting and partnering with Wisconsin law firms since 1986. Hi, Russell Nicolay here with Nicolay Law, Accident and Injury Lawyers. If you have clients that have been injured, my office would love the opportunity to help them get compensated and get their life back on track. We handle referrals and co-counsel relationships on injury cases all across Wisconsin. Thank you. And now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. So 63 years in practice, you still practice in law. Why didn't you leave? I, I you know, other than loving my family... There's nothing I, I, I really care about as much as being a lawyer. No, and, no. and when my doctor friends all tell me they're retiring because they're 60 <laughs> years old and they're exhausted, I say, 
What are you going to do? <laughs> so let me ask. Let me ask another question in that vein. Do you think the fact that you you've always been involved in other things beyond law somehow has helped you preserve your love for law? Yes, unequivocally, yes. That's a really good question, Emil. Um, and those were a lot of gems that, I mean, I don't know. I felt chills hearing <laughs> you say that because it's true. And people like Emil and I that get involved and respond to all the different things, you can look like a busybody to a person who doesn't understand that, well, these are things that I love and that I think I have the opportunity to sit at the table. Um, so I do that because it helps you beyond, it, it helps you love your work more, at least for me. If I have rest in the sense of doing something else that's not law, and then I can come back to my job as a practicing attorney, I don't know, I feel I learned something new and I learned something more about the practice and it helps me interacting with people. Um, so I love that you asked that question and I love that it was a short Yes, like <laughs> unequivocally, yes. Yeah. So we've always known that this episode would be very hard because of who we're talking to and all the different facets of your life. But I want to go back to the idea of, of range, right? So we look at your career. We you know, you talked about how you got your U.S. attorney position and how you, you've, been, you, you've always responded to the call of service wherever and whenever it's arose. Now, at some point in time, you left from being prosecutor and you decided to start your own practice on the opposite side of the, the V, as I call it. What led to that? So when I got the job in the U.S. Attorney's Office, what I was looking for was a, a job where I would get in the courtroom, where I'd be able to try cases and uh, have experience that really transcended my level of experience. And when you're a young lawyer in a prosecutor's office or a public office, you're what they got. And uh, when I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office starting in 1963, there were four assistant U.S. attorneys. They, they handled about 250 cases. So I tried a dozen jury trials every year. Uh, some were a day, two or three long. And uh, the, one, the, the one that concluded my government career was a prosecution of Frank Bellastrari, who was ostensibly the head of the mafia in Milwaukee. That trial was in Springfield, Illinois, and that trial lasted three months. So I was living in Springfield, Illinois for three months, four weeks of which was a, a motion to suppress hearing. There was a, there was a month long delay in the middle of the trial because his Chicago lawyer, who was a big tough guy, Maury Walsh, had a heart attack and they stopped the jury trial and called it off for a, for a month. And then we oh, wow. resumed. But, uh, to answer your question with, with a level of specificity, it was never my intent to be a government lawyer. It was always my intent to be a private lawyer. It was always my intent to be a private litigating lawyer. That's what I wanted to do. That was my goal. And this was uh, like taking a graduate course mm. in being a trial lawyer. Because my first three years as a lawyer, I tried one jury case and, you know, it was whether or not to the cap should have been screwed on tighter or not. It was a case of no consequence. And so at that time, we're talking about 1968, criminal lawyers were looked upon by and large in the bar as kind of like uh, lesser individuals, the bottom of the barrel. And while Frank Gimbel in 1968 was a pretty well-known lawyer because I had several high profile cases which got a lot of attention in the newspaper. There wasn't television coverage of things at the time. For example, the Balistre case, which was in Springfield, Illinois, the journal sent a reporter down there, lived there down there every day. So there's an article every day. But the point is that nobody would hire me, surprising. And so I decided I'm going to open my own office. And I took my secretary from the U.S. Attorney's Office. I said, uh, I'm going to open an office. I did get an office from my father-in-law at the Caswell building down the street here on Wisconsin and uh, Plankington. And it was the law office of Frank Gimple. So, so th that's, th that's shocking to me, given your high profile after the Ballesteria case, dozens of uh, trial experience at the time, that when you decided or when you decided it was time for you to go back into private practice, that no one would hire you. Right. Did you ever figure out what, uh, I mean, you've, you've had a very extensive career now, and all accounts very successful. 
And have you ever reflected on that period as to why, why that was the case, or you just don't care? Well, I have reflected, and I don't care. But I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that's why, that's why I put that in there. I really don't care. As the I mean, option. <laughs> I mean, one, one of my best friends in law school is a guy named Dave Cannon, and Dave Cannon and I went to law school every day on the green bus. I didn't have a car. He didn't have a car. We were both young. And uh, he became district attorney in Milwaukee County. He became United States attorney. Uh, his family had a law firm. But when he left the U.S. attorney's job, he went to work for Michael Best. And I think that was probably one of the early times that a big name law firm in Milwaukee hired a criminal lawyer. And he and I were friends till he died about 10 years ago. He actually gave my son, Josh, uh, his job out of law school. And so personal relationships and and, and uh, colleagues that you meet along the road of your life have influence on decisions that you make and turns that you make as you make decisions about what am I going to do tomorrow. And uh, I wanted to be a criminal trial lawyer. I wasn't going to conform whatever litigation skills I had to the mold of a big Milwaukee corporate law firm. So I decided I would start my own law office. And what happened uh, after uh, that was... There were several weeks when I had to take money from home to pay my secretary. I didn't have rent, so I thought that was a good thing going for me. And I went to all the judges who had uh, court-appointed uh, authority to give you cases, and they didn't have a public defender system in those days. Okay. And I was trying several juries, so I would say one every two or three weeks, and uh, I learned how to defend people without resources. Hmm. I was their resource. And while 90% of those cases were state cases, and I got paid like 40 or $50 an hour, it was enough to pay the rent. And within a matter of a year, people started to knock on my door and uh, ask to hire me. And about a year, year and a half after I opened the office, a guy named Jerry Boyle, who was a deputy district attorney in Milwaukee County, a real uh, extraordinarily talented Irish Catholic trial lawyer, left the DA's office when he lost to Mike McCann for the job. And he joined me. So it was Gimble and Boyle. And then my brother, who was a Justice Department lawyer and an accountant, came to join us. So it was Gimble, Gimble, and Boyle. That was the predecessor. And now, a word from our sponsors. Attention, legal professionals. Legal disputes can often be intense, and personal safety is paramount. Introducing Reduce Your Risk, a guide to personal safety and security for the legal community. Empower yourself with the expert insights to minimize risks at the office, courthouse, home, and online. Create an actionable safety plan, align ethics with safety and enhance well-being. Stay ahead of potential threats. Get your copy today at whispar.org. Empower your practice, ensure your safety, reduce your risk. Thank you, and now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. You know, uh, much of the things that trial lawyers do is instinctive and it doesn't matter what part of the chapter book of your life uh, presents a, a, an opportunity for a decision. Your reaction is instinctive because you are conditioned when you're a trial lawyer to act on instincts, particularly if you're a criminal defense lawyer because mm -hmm. corporate lawyers can have depositions, corporate lawyers can have um, interrogatories, they can have hours, days, weeks, and months of preparation. When you walk into the courtroom as a criminal defense lawyer, you've read interviews of the people who are going to be the government witnesses. But uh, you have not had, un in most circumstances, an opportunity to have a conversation with them. They belong to the other side. And so you have to have good instincts about uh, where might I, as a representative of this client or group of clients of mine, where can I put a dent in the building of the other side's case? And again, it's responsive. So the word responsiveness comes back, even though you may not think of it in those terms. Mm -hmm. But when you're a trial lawyer, you are responsive to what the other side is doing. And your success is based on your ability to respond well. Uh, I have been lucky, and I have some natural BS qualities. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, permit me to dramatize from time to time. You know, I have, I've been in a courtroom. I was trying a jury trial in Milwaukee where there was a professional snitch on the stand. 
and I was working him, and I was going through all the different cases where he had been in some compromising situation, got arrested, got charged, and then worked his way out by putting someone else down. And I worked this guy to the point where he literally came off of the witness, off of the witness chair, came after me in the courtroom. I never was more excited in my <laughs> life. I, I said, we win this case. No question about it. This guy wanted to give me a pop. <laughs> and you know, that doesn't happen every day, and not every lawyer has the opportunity to do that. But there you have to have the ability to know when to respond to the point where you see that a witness has got some level of vulnerability, and you would just have to go find it and turn the lights on it and get that person to view you and not the environment that he or she is performing in as the adversary and, and take them beyond their capacity to be in control. Hmm. And I mean, you do that on, on a regular basis as a young man, <laughs> and you're very good at it, and you're going to be an extraordinary success. Thank you. If you were to talk to lawyers today about what to do right out of law school or what to do during the early phases of their careers, what would be that advice? Like, what would you tell them? Uh, you have to get on the street. You have to get involved. And as a young lawyer, I say this to Emil, and I think this is very uh, important. Get involved in things outside of your household. Uh, unless you walk into a situation where you have, and I like to think today's Gimbel Riley, Garner Brown has this, you have uh, magnets that bring in enough business for the magnet and for his or her people that support their efforts. You, you've got to generate business. And you can't generate business sitting at home or sitting in the library watching TV. Uh, you've got to generate business by being in the, in, in the community unless you've got somebody who's going to be the generator for you. And, 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 and any of the lawyers or, or law students that are watching this, if I can give you advice that uh, has served this guy well, it is uh, always, always, always be aware of opportunities to interact with other people. If it's in the filling station, the car wash, the grocery store, your religious organization, uh, community organizations that you may have a, a special relationship with. Get involved, get involved, be available, uh, volunteer your skills and, and, and opportunity to the point where always realize that there is a commercial ingredient that flows from that. Um, th there's, and so what you just said reminded me of, of what Kristen does as well. There's this rootless pragmatism in, in your approach. What I mean by that is, so for example, Kristen always jokes around and I think she's joking, but I think she's also being honest that she's an introvert who pretends to be an extrovert to get by. <laughs> and, 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 and you don't understand how powerful that is because that takes a rootless sense of pragmatism because, you know, at the same time, this introvert is someone who will take an opportunity to get to know folks from different aspects, um, you know, a lot of, I mean, skills are great. And, you know, obviously you're a great lawyer, but even in the stories you provided, there's that element of connections. I also know that, you know, something that's also served Kristen in her career as well. And they said, I use her as an example because she's not even in the litigation field, is the ability to develop, cultivate relationships because you never know when that next relationship might just be the yes you need down the line. But you just do it in the meantime, not because you want something, but because. I think the word I'm looking for is because you some, you choose to take an interest in people, a, a genuine interest in people. So I just wanted to tease that out because obviously as a trial lawyer, I get it. Like it's very all consuming, but also understanding that some, some, you know, lots of folks don't do trial work, but I do believe that those nuggets of advice that you provided does transcend, you know, your average litigator as well. So I just want to make sure folks don't miss that and just tune your ears um, off to that. But, but, but Chris, I think I'm going to hand it over here. I think you got, yeah. you got your structured questions. I'll just be asking. No, it's okay. Random Mule questions never Frank follows my structure. It's completely hey. fine. This is great. No, this is awesome. Uh, Frank never, Frank is not ready to follow any structure. That's and completely be fine. He's the guest. <laughs> <laughs> he does not have to follow our structure at all. So we talk about all these things, you know, your career, 
and opportunities for um, young attorneys to get more involved in things they should be doing, not sitting at home. That's going to be a common theme of this podcast is not sitting at home. But what do you think are some of the pressing challenges or, or even opportunities of young lawyers entering the profession in 2023 and 2024? Well, uh, you know, I, I'm not uh, on the street, if you will, with that. In and outside? <laughs> <laughs> All right, just go ahead. <laughs> uh, that's a common uh, statement. On the street means that you're mixing, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and I, I do believe that uh, today the uh, cost of uh, college education is so grossly different than when I was a kid going to school. And many of these folks are graduating with this humongous debt. I don't know how, quite frankly, a a young lawyer today who comes uh, away from his or her law school degree with a six-figure debt, $100,000 or north of that, can just go out and hustle clients and, and support themselves if they have a family and also support operating a law office. So you almost need to get a salary job. But even getting a salary job, I think, should not be uh, disincentivizing to going out on the street and getting involved because most lawyers, and when I say most lawyers, I'm, I'm thinking primarily the University of Wisconsin lawyers because I have the most experience with them, although I've tried cases around the country. And boy, is there a different cultural flavor when you go in as a lawyer for somebody in North Carolina than uh, going into uh, someone in Racine, Wisconsin. But the fact is that I think most lawyers need to do more than just practice law to support themselves when they get out of law school. And I did that as well. I mean, among the things I did when I graduated from law school, I took this popcorn job. And I don't mean to denigrate the guy who hired me. But I, I had a, an office where I did tax returns. I can hardly read a tax return. But I, off, I opened up an office on 27th and Fond du Lac above uh, Johnny's Roundup, which was a, a working man's tavern, and uh, an office above Walgreens on Kinnikinnick and Layton, uh, which was a Walgreens drugstore that my father-in-law owned. And Johnny's Roundup was owned by a relative of mine. And I did tax returns for five, ten, and fifteen dollars a piece. And so, uh, when I finished my day in the office at five o'clock, I might go home and have a half hour with my wife and children, and go to the office for three hours and and make thirty bucks. Today, you might be able to charge fifty dollars or a hundred dollars. But the point of the matter is that I also worked in a clothing store in Whitefish Bay while I was uh, in high school. When I got out of high school while I was an undergrad in the summertime. When I was a lawyer, I went and worked in a clothing store on weekends. So you can have multiple streams of income uh, as long as you don't look in the mirror and say, hey, I'm a lawyer. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to go do tax returns for 10 bucks a piece or today $200 a piece. I'm not going to go sell a guy a tie for $25 at that time when I was selling him for $2.50. So you have to, you have, to have a, a kind of a a hustle ingredient in your person if you're going to develop your own business of the law. And I say the business of the law is where you're responsible for paying for the lights being on, paying for that support staff that you have. I remember when I left the government, I opened my first office at the Caswell Building when this guy came up and uh, had uh, an offer for sale, the first typewriter with a screen. So, you know, when you're practicing law for 63 years, there's been a lot of (laughs) chapters in the book of life of Frank (laughs) Gimble. And uh, I remember that we, we, I think the price was somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,500 for one of those machines. Okay, $2,500 was uh, a lot of money when you were paying your secretary 100 bucks a week. That's 25 weeks. And and when when a person came in with a drunk driving case in... 1968, if I got $500, that was a lot of money. Today, if someone walks in the office at one of these traffic defense firms, you know, they're going to pay $5,000 for a drunk driving case. So while the numbers change, the formula, which is responsive to your 
question, I think. The formula for surviving as a lawyer after you graduate from law school is not different. You have to hustle and you have to augment, if you will, uh, being this lawyer by doing other stuff and try to keep the meter running wherever you are, whether the meter's a lawyer charging by the hour or somebody who gets a commission by selling some product door to door or in a store or uh, having uh, the sale of, uh, of a service within the broad range of services that accountants and lawyers offer. And now a word from our sponsors. Are you struggling with work-life balance issues? Could you use some help addressing these challenges? Wislap offers confidential well-being support to lawyers, judges, and law students. With trained peer volunteers, structured well-being resources, and individualized support services, Wislap aims to foster work-life balance within the Wisconsin legal community. Find us on the web at wispar.org slash wislap. Would you like to implement new efficiencies into your law practice but don't know where to begin? Practice 411, the State Bar of Wisconsin's Law Office Management Assistance Program, is the place to start. Don't wait. Contact Practice 411 today for a complimentary and confidential consultation at 1-800-957-4670. In these uncertain economic times, the State Bar of Wisconsin wants to make sure that you and your practice have the best available tools. Ultimate Pass and Books Unbound are available for purchase using six-month installment plans. Contact our customer service team at 1-800-728-7788 for more information. Thank you. And now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. So you not only do criminal defense, you you also do civil litigation. I do. Um, and you do administrative uh, law work with municipal stuff and labor and employment stuff with negotiations and all that. So, I mean, in a world like ours where there's a lot of emphasis, especially in pressures on younger lawyers to over-specialize or hyper-specialize, and not just hyper-specialize, but hyper-specialize very early. What lessons have you learned from having such a diverse practice? Well, I've learned that there are risks of collision in uh, certain aspects of your practice. I was uh, looking at some of historical experiences of FMG uh, in advance of talking to you to brilliant young lawyers. I noticed that while I was on the Fire and Police Commission, this was between 1978 and 1982, I undertook to, re to represent a police officer who was 20 years off the job, who had a partner who came forward and said that 20 years earlier, he shot a young black man in the back and planted a gun uh, at his side. That client's name was Tom Grady. And Michael McCann was the uh, district attorney. And the guy who pointed the finger at my client got all kinds of journalistic publicity and TV publicity. And the guy hired me. Uh, and I undertook the case. And I went to see McCann. And I said, you can't prosecute him uh, for anything but first-degree murder. And this isn't close to a first-degree murder case. And he said, well, uh, if you don't waive the statute of limitations, I'm going to charge him with first-degree murder. So I went to see Mr. Grady. And Mr. Grady was a truck driver living in Nebraska or someplace. And I said, uh, here are your choices. You can enter a plea to reckless homicide, but you have to waive the statute of limitations to do that. Or you can uh, say, I'm not pleading guilty to anything because I don't think I committed a crime. I think I had a reason to do what I did at the time. And I can defend you. But if you lose that case, you're going to prison for life. The, the court has no alternative. He opted to take the deal. Well, I got a ton of publicity. And a, a portion of it was, how can Frank Gimbel represent a police murderer and be someone who regulates the police department, because that was the time I was on the Fire Police Commission. So there was a public outcry for my either dropping the case or resigning from the Fire Police Commission. And the chief of police at the time was a guy named Harold Breyer, who was a real staunch, autocratic guy. And he didn't care that I represented Grady and stand on the Fire Police Commission, although he wanted me off the Fire and Police Commission because I brought with me experience as a federal prosecutor and I wasn't afraid of the police. But I stayed with Grady and I, I, I worked out, a, a, he wound up going to prison and I stayed on the Fire and Police Commission. 
among the things that happened to me at the, uh, towards the end of my fire and police commission five-year term was that uh, I ruled on a couple of cops who had been fired for being caught having sex in squad car outside of the city of Milwaukee while they're theoretically on duty, and uh, I sustained their firing. So the union wanted me off. So I, I said, I'm resigning. Then the union had a petition to keep me uh, because I was pretty friendly to them. So there were, there were these conflicts of interest that happen on a regular basis in, in these kinds of things. But to your question, I represented the Milwaukee County Deputy Sheriff's Union for 31 years, all the time of which I was also a criminal defense lawyer. So here I'm the labor lawyer for the cops, and I'm representing the people that they're arresting. And, and that, that was a unique situation to me. And I got away with it. <laughs> and, 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 and then I, 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 what I'm thinking about is whether this is the right question to respond to it or not. There was a, there was a young lawyer who worked for one of the big firms, and he had a matter in bankruptcy court. And he approached the clerk in the bankruptcy court, and he wanted to see the bankruptcy judge. And uh, the clerk said, well, I'll have to talk to the bankruptcy judge and set an appointment. I want to talk to her now. And he got pretty abusive. The clerk went in and told the bankruptcy judge what this guy had said. She came out and she said, uh, you said you want to see me now? You said you, and you abuse this lady? And he said, well, I don't think I abused. Well, I think you did. You are disbarred from the bankruptcy court for three years. He says, can I be heard? Yeah, you can be heard. Well, I want to, I want to talk to a lawyer, okay? Sets the thing up for like a month later, and the guy comes and hires me. And what I said to him was that uh, if, if you are going to be successful, uh, having acceptability, if you will, as a lawyer with a responsible attitude about humankind, that has to apply to everybody you interact with in the justice system. And it, it has served Frank Gimbel very, very well, that when I walk in the courtroom, the support staff all knows me. We are, and I treat them equivalent to the judge. And you do that. And you do that. And, and young lawyers sometimes think there's this hierarchy. That's a horrible mistake. It turns out that he got down on his knees figuratively in front of the judge when we went back there. And he begged for forgiveness. He begged the clerk for forgiveness. And he talked about the harshness of the lesson they learned, but that he, you know, that he got counseled by his lawyer, who was a senior guy who he respected, and that uh, he didn't appreciate uh, how outrageous his behavior was. And this female bankruptcy judge says, you're off the hook. Remember the lesson you got from Mr. Gimbel. I felt really good about that from the point of view of the message. And, and, and whoever watches this, if this portion is in the conversation, every lawyer who walks in the courtroom, remember... There are no people in that courtroom, whether it's a bailiff, a clerk, or a court reporter, that is less important than the judge. And you should and must treat them with proper respect and courtesy and respectability. And if you don't, you're a fool. <laughs> and you won't do well. That's a good lesson. That's a good life lesson outside of the courtroom, outside of the practice of law. Treating everybody with respect and remembering um, there is no hierarchy, especially when it comes to respect. Uh, everyone deserves it. Everyone you meet, they they truly do deserve it. That's a good lesson. That well, and, and it served me well. And and I and I I guess that I I probably came by that by reason of the fact that I didn't walk into the practice of law with credentials. Uh, I didn't come from a, a rich family, a well-educated family. Uh, I didn't have personal wealth. I didn't have personal position in the universe. Yeah. I was just a guy who had a law license. Well, well I, I think that lawyers tend to be predisposed and acting in such ways because, and I'm not saying all lawyers do, but I, I think it comes from a misunderstanding of what the profession is. Because, you know, we talk to people, younger students or people in law school, young lawyers, and they have the sense that it's all about the stature of being a lawyer rather than service. As a matter of fact, one of the first things I tell people when they tell me, that if, if I meet a potential law school student or a new lawyer and they tell me they're in the law because they want to make a crap ton of money, I usually tell them, 
this is not the highest and best use of your time. I can tell you a ton of other things that require way less effort. So if that's the reason you're trying to do this, or one of the funny things would be where you know, Chris and I back in the day would go to, would go to like events uh, as young, younger lawyers and people would literally introduce themselves with the name of the firms they worked in. It was all you could tell. So when, when you have that culture, and I, I think it is a toxic culture within, you know, within the legal profession that's built off of just, you know, the stature of being a lawyer rather than the service. And even when you provide the service, it's tied to the stature. I think you create an environment like that because my, I mean, our, our, my philosophy is, I mean, I, I will probably relate if, if I, if I would respect a bartender or my server or my waitress who I believe is a good person and afford them more respect than, you know, the most experienced, most successful lawyer in town who I just think isn't a decent person. But that whole idea of like seeing people at, at, at for who they are, respect them for who they are rather than what you think they are. But but I, I think yeah, if, if we get back and I think we're doing this, and I, and I, I don't think usually People, I think government lawyers understand this fundamentally because especially when you choose to become a government lawyer or you work, you, you know, I mean, your, your value systems aren't in doubt in terms of what you prioritize in the law. And I think that's something that we can learn from our friends and our colleagues. And I hear that in terms of all that you said today from working three jobs while you're in law school, opening a law firm and doing tax planning at night and you know, just 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 to make ends meet. It wasn't meet. tax planning. I got people brought their W two. You look at it. I would know how to tax plan. But there, it's, it's that you know, it's, it's a sense of humility. Hustle. There's a hustle. Hustle. hustle and humility. It's humility and hustle. That's and true. and, and yeah. the beautiful. And I wouldn't call you so. You're not docile. I mean, you're, docile. you're you're a very proud guy. You're you know, but but. What's so interesting about the story you just told, right, is you don't shy away from who you are and where you've been. It's this idea of, you know, you present to the world who you are, no, no less and no more at every point in time. I can, see, I can sense the pride in how you talk about it while also revealing the humility of the experiences rather than just paying mere lip service. Because you can talk about being the most humble person in the world. Right. If you're not willing to go drive an Uber to make ends meet because you think you're a lawyer, well, I, I don't know what a proud person looks like. It's like it sounds Fair stupid, enough. you know. That's true. So uh, it's true. just so many layers. Like, no. Kristen, I, I, oh, I, I'm I, like in deep in thought. Thank, thank you so much for dropping all of these gems and giving us your time. Truly, it's been an honor to sit with a legend, a legal legend, whatever Emil's new title is for this series. <laughs> um, so we really appreciate your time, and hopefully attorneys, young attorneys alike, can clean a lot of these jewels that we have from listening to this conversation. Well, thank you for the compliments. I um, I don't think that I deserve any accolades for having this conversation. I think you deserve accolades for putting together the show. And uh, what is most distressing to this 87-year-old cancer-surviving guy is that uh, I don't think that the law is a better place from the point of view of opportunity today than it was 63 years ago. Well, we got some work to do. Thank you very much, Frank. I really appreciate it. It's a wrap. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have a topic you'd like us to explore, let us know. I'm your host, Emilio Villagale, and we'll catch you next time.